The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone to the Rebel Capitalist Show that, uh, quite frankly, I have a ton of not just respect for, but admiration. I, I cannot say enough about this individual, uh, but I need to start off by saying thank you uh, to Mr. Jim Grant, because when I got into just understanding investment, finance, macroeconomics in 2012, uh, there were a handful of people that really, really influenced my thinking. And Mr. Jim Grant was right at the top of the list. So I told him this when we had a panel discussion together at the New Orleans Investment Conference, that if it wasn't for him, uh, I probably wouldn't have a YouTube channel right now or a podcast or a live event or any of the, the other things that I have. So I need to start off by saying uh, thank you to uh, Mr. Jim Grant, not only for being on the show today, but for helping me get to where I am today. Well, George, you're entirely welcome. I am taking it back. It's nice to hear. Thank you. <laughs> so, Jim, I know that you're a uh, historian a financial historian. So I want to try to tap into your wisdom and experience. Uh, for many, me included, it seems like we're living in unprecedented times, not just with COVID, but now with what's going on with Russia, Ukraine. I know history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. So what, what time frame in American history does what we're living through right now rhyme with? Yeah. Well, of course, nothing is, a uh, few things are ever really literally new under the sun. Uh, the Spanish flu epidemic and just after World War I, certainly uh, it was much more you know, lethal uh, than today's version of COVID. As for the monetary stuff, you know, that might in fact come close to being a singularity where we are we notoriously had a paper money regime in the early days of the Republic. Um, and uh, it was in reaction and indeed revulsion against that, that the founders instituted something they thought would ensure a species standard, gold or silver, yeah. years ahead. Um, but I think never have we seen the, uh, uh, the overlay of uh, raging inflation uh, and a 0%, now getting a little wonky, but a 0% federal funds rate. And as of we, as now we were speaking, uh, so-called quantitative easing, QE is still going, it's kind of winding down, but in the face of a, a pretty severe inflation, the Fed has set its uh, little tiny policy interest rate at nil and continues to buy securities with money that didn't exist before the Fed tapped keys on a computer pad to call those dollar bills into existence. So in the monetary regime, um, you know, we call it here at Grants the PhD standard, which is the more or less unbridled management of our monetary affairs by former tenured faculty members at our leading universities. It's, um, it's kind of a new thing. Do you think it's similar to the 1940s? Because well, it's, yeah, it's, it's similar a little bit in that uh, between 1942 and 1951, uh, the uh, Fed instituted uh, uh, what we would now call yield curve controls. It, uh, it pegged, that was the verb, it pegged uh, rates of interest along the curve, short to long. The bill rate was three eighths of 1%. The long bond was something like two and a quarter, two and a half. Rates more or less where they are today. The bill rate, of course, three eighths one percent is towering over what we have seen the past ten years. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, the but at that time there was at least nominally an anchor on the value of the dollar. It was defined as one thirty fifth of an ounce of gold. Now during World War II, uh, there was no action so far as foreign central banks, which had the right to exchange their green paper for bullion at that right once. One dollar, sorry, uh, thirty-five dollars to the ounce. All of that, uh, the, the mechanics of the gold standard were in suspense. So the gold standard was really in the deep freeze; it did not function. Um, and uh, you could see that uh, the, 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 you could see that played out in the immense expansion of indebtedness in this country to finance World War II. So that that was a that was a kind of a flyaway debt regime with a. You know, 
with, with very low interest rates and financial repression, as it's now called. And huge inflation. Yeah, a huge inflation that was that was uh, masked through price controls. But after controls came off, of course, that inflation came to the fore in the data. In 1946 and 47, I guess especially, we saw yeah. inflation in double digits and the bonds still trading at uh, two and a quarter. So, so that, that, that bears some resemblance to what we have today. But um, that was in the, uh, in the teeth of, uh, of you know, World War II. That was a... Uh, a rather different geopolitical proposition than uh, COVID. Yeah, well, Pretext, the, the reason for the current round of of monetary uh, action, intervention. Yeah, yeah. I hope it's not uh, something that we'll see in the future with with what's happening in Russia. You know, we'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed there that cooler heads prevail. Uh, I want to ask you just kind of a basic question that might not be so basic. Uh, why are interest rates important? Why are free market interest rates important? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Now, I'm talking in my book now. I'm, um, our little journalistic lemonade stand is called Grant's Interest Rate Interest Rate Observer. You can imagine right. uh, when there were no interest rates, these past we have a heck of a thing for our business model. <laughs> Even a magnifying glass to see the rate of interest. Um, but interest rates um, are the Swiss army knives of, uh, of our finances. You know, you use them to, uh, uh, to calibrate or measure credit risk. You can tell how credit worthy or not a borrower is by the rate of interest that it pays. Interest rates discount future cash flows. Uh, they are the price of time, as someone once said. Um, they help us to uh, set investment hurdle rates you can think of them as a traffic signals in a market economy. You know, they say go fast, go slow. Um, they uh, indicate the level of liquidity um, available. You know, if it's, things are tight, rates are generally high. And if rates are peculiarly low, as they are today, you can kind of conjecture that the reason might be that somebody has his or her thumb on the scales and that someone would be our monetary masters at the Federal Reserve. So I have contended, George, that, uh, uh, that because our interest rates are not discovered in the marketplace these days, but rather imposed from on high, or if not imposed, heavily influenced from on high, that to that extent, we are living in a kind of financial dream world. We are living in a hall of mirrors because things are not what they seem. Um, uh, if interest rates are essentially nil, there is no discipline in the financial markets, or very little discipline. You know, companies can say, yeah, in year, year 2047, we'll be earning $6 a share. Oh, that's good, yeah, very good. Now a proper rate of interest would check that uh, tendency because uh, people would, would uh, um, would discount that claim and say, ah, no, it's, 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 I'm not going to bet on that because for one thing, I can get 5% on a treasury bill. I'm not going to take that right. distant uh, line of, um, of uh, fantasy. And so in, the, in, the, uh, in this world of, um, you can also think of, I guess, as, 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 as zero gravity or weightlessness. You can imagine uh, and some of our billionaires floating around in space when they take their rides into the ether. You know? There's Jeff Bezos floating around. And, <laughs> but um, uh, uh, without interest rates, we all kind of live in a zero gravity financial world. We're kind of floating around, you know, buying NFTs and, uh, and uh, you know, DraftKings and uh, Bitcoin, all that stuff, you know. Zero gravity, George. That's the yeah. concept. It just it just pushes people further and further out the risk curve. Yeah, I say yes. I think it does. Well, then, then you know that's an old that's an old observation. My um, one of my uh, biographical subjects named Walter Badgett, who was a guy who lived in the middle of the nineteenth century, and he was the kind of the monetary muse of the gold standard era. He was uh, uh, he was credited or blamed for the doctrine that central banks uh, in the time of crisis ought to 
to lend freely, but he also said to lend at a high rate of interest and um, against good collateral. Yeah. Our central bankers today especially recall the, uh, the idea of lending freely. The rest of it, they kind of forget. Yeah. But and, it said, uh, uh, you're alluding to the national symbol of Britain. He said that John Bull can stand many things, but he can't stand 2%, meaning that a rate of interest as low as 2% would incite a lot of speculation and get a lot of people hurt because they would uh, start uh, you know, buying the bonds of these emerging markets you know, in South America and elsewhere. And they would, there were a lot of cycles of emerging market boom and bust during Badgett's time. And he linked uh, unusually low rates of interest to, uh, to that uh, kind of be financial behavior. Mm. And see it today. I mean, pension funds, and everyone needing a, um, you know, a certain uh, a rate of interest uh, with which to uh, satisfy uh, actuarial demands. It's, you know, looking around for things to do. You know, how do we do that when the 10 year treasury is yielding, you know, less than 2%? Well, the junk bonds yielding uh, two and a quarter, <laughs> or uh, emerging Russian debt. That seemed promising until about two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't, I don't think we've seen the last of the consequences of this feature for yield. In fact, I'm quite sure we have not. It'll, it'll come out in the wash. Is it fair to say that if interest rates are the price of money and money or dollars currency is one half of every single transaction, then if you're manipulating interest rates, you're effectively manipulating the price of everything that you can buy in the economy? Yes, directly or indirectly. Certainly, you manipulate directly uh, the price and valuation of financial assets. And insofar as financial assets feed into uh, the other uh, daily occupations in our economic world, they, uh, they also manipulate that. I said the, the direct and consequential outcome of uh, suppressed interest rates is, well, you know, kind of think of it, George. When interest rates are, are manipulated, especially when they are suppressed and pressed down to kind of long level, there's a lot of wasted uh, capital. Like people undertake projects for which there is uh, no real demand, a fanciful, imagined one. The imagination can run rampant in this world that we decided a moment ago was kind of the level of zero gravity. And uh, there's a lot of um, waste, a lot of it's, you know, a lot of it's fun. Uh, people have uh, taken up speculation, not just because they hope to have a, a sound and sensible early retirement, because it's fun and lights dance and, and uh, you get a little splash of confetti on your Robin Hood account, you're used to it. So, the, so, so um, uh, this, but there is, there is amusement, and I guess that's an economic good. Uh, but there's also a lot of uh, misdirected capital, a lot of uh, white elephants, a lot of waste. And that, that have, that those have real world consequences. How many of the businesses in Kathy Wood's portfolio do you think would exist today if we never got below 5% Fed funds? Uh, I think fewer to be sure. You know, that even during gold standard times, uh, there, have, there were cycles of... Uh, Great enthusiasm over uh, technological developments, you know, periodic railroad booms in the early and mid, especially in the mid 19th century. There were uh, great excitement over um, all manner of uh, canal boom in Britain and in this country as well. And so, you know, I think there's a tendency sometimes, and I certainly feel it because I have developed such an antipathy towards the Fed, how it operates, what it seems to stand for, how it's peopled, you know, what those people seem to believe. I've developed this antipathy, but I, I check myself at times, I try to, by recalling how many of the, um, of the blemishes that we see in our own financial lives seem to be congenital to the human condition, not just to a given monetary regime. You know, people, I've often reflected that money is not humanity's best subject. You know, around large sums of money, people just go crazy. And, and um, 
which reminds me of the, um, of the um, to me, the unintended humor of the idea of an efficient market in which there is the, um, you know, the pure and hygienic discounting of expected cash flows. And there is the perfect competition and the perfect dissemination of information amongst all players, all these freaking dick. No, that's not the way the world operates. When you get around a potential big sum of money, it's like falling in love and you go crazy. Yeah, so right. And things and can't sleep at night. <laughs> so I, I, was, I would say that the truth falls somewhere between the efficient markets hypothesis, the soft form, and my somewhat uh, exaggerated hyperbolic uh, riff on it. But, um, uh, but Kathy Woods, I think there have been Kathy Woods's during um, the pure gold standard during the interwar fake gold standard called the gold exchange standard. There were Kathy Woods's during the Bretton Woods twilight fake gold standard. And there is the real Kathy Woods during our PhD study. Yeah, so we can't, we can't say that um, artificially low interest rates are the total cause of the speculation that we see in the market today or the hysteria, but it definitely contributes or it exacerbates. It does, it does it, and, and, it, and it, uh, what it also does is elongate these mm. booms, deepen the, 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 uh, uh, the risk and the preconditions of a serious bust. And then what happens? Well, the Fed comes in and the Fed cuts that short. So we pile debt on debt and boom on boom until boom. Boom. Yeah, I, and, uh, I, I'd love to go back to the, the price discovery or the price signals and why that's so important. And when we were in New Orleans, uh, you gave a speech and you told a story that I think illustrates beautifully why prices are so important and also not just prices, but maybe the unintended consequences George, are you, are you referring to a 10 cent beer night at Cleveland's Municipal Stadium? Yes, I am. I think that's it. <laughs> okay, so I think the year is like 1974. And the, and the India is now called the Guardians. But the India has done anything for 20 years since 1954. And the front office knew that it had to be something to get people into the park besides a good starting picture. So let us sell beers at the heavily discounted price of 10 cents, they decided. Right. So this is announced and 25,000 self-selected individuals <laughs> push their way through the turnstiles, this old cavernous ball yard. And the game progresses and the cheering gets a little bit uh, rowdy. And uh, before you know it, fans are down the field introducing themselves to the players. And, uh, and uh, the score is uh, nine to nothing. That's a forfeit, George. Cleveland lost the game. With the tying run on third base at the bottom of the ninth, and the, wouldn't you know it, so um, it turns, and, and so you know, it, there was a full moon, but that wasn't the problem. That wasn't the reason for the <laughs> emergency room visits, the streakers, or the arrests. The problem was the mispricing of a substance even more potent than credit. <laughs> 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 so I have, uh, I've come to see it. Somebody said, you have to look at 10 cent beer night. I said, ah, this is the perfect <laughs> metaphor an analogy for what we have been uh, living through. Yeah, exactly. Astounding things in the going on in the marketplace and, and the most improbable uh, companies coming public, you know, electric truck, this, and NFT, that, <laughs> going to be okay. I mean, uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the general, you know, so Paul Volcker in the mid 1970s uh, started talking about the indiscipline of finance. This is not, Gold, you know, gold uh, definition of the dollar ended in 1971, famously. And, the, and during that inflation, there, there came to be a visible lack of discipline. And I've certainly seen this, perhaps you have as well in the past uh, 10 or dozen years. All sorts of stuff has happened that wouldn't happen, I think, with a, as you say, with a 5% funds rate. Um, we'd have, it would be less amusing if we had a 5% funds rate. It'd be uh, less good copy, as we say in journalism, but it might have been better for the country. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to go back to just kind of the, 
you know, the Fed having their uh, their hand on the scale, if that's the right uh, way to say it, or the, the Fed really being active in, let's say, money markets. Um, I know there's a lot of information that we can get from the yield curve, and uh, especially when it starts to flatten and when it inverts, you know, there's an extremely high probability uh, that we go into a recession. But if the Fed is involved in the, the bond market, the treasury market, to the degree to which they are, um, should, how much should we, how much weight should we give the flattening of the yield curve now? I guess that's my best question. Yeah, good question. Well, um, let's define terms. So what is a yield curve? It's a, this is simply the spectrum of interest rates over time. So it stretches from zero, which is like this instant to um, 30 years. And uh, typically uh, bonds maturing later, longer dated securities have a higher yield because um, of the, uh, the typical human preference for something available now rather than having to wait. So the impatience of the ordinary human being accounts for the conventional shape of the yield curve, meaning again, that a 30-year bond yields more than a 30-day treasury bill. That's the way typically it works. So enter the Fed. So the Fed that now uh, has control, typically pretty good control over the very, very short term. There's less control over the two to five-year period. There's influence there from that direct control. It has much, it has um, a rhetorical control. It tells you what to think. Talk or it primes the market by setting expectations. And so there's a little bit of a psychological game going on with longer days, but it has no, it has very little direct control over 30 years. Okay, except for setting expectations of its own policy. What is happening now is that the, the difference between two year yields and 10 year yields has become very narrow. Now, that's not strictly the definition of a, of a, of a yield curve as I take it. As, a, as an inflation signaling, you know, a recession signaling, or a boom signaling uh, phenomenon, I think the better uh, space of the yield curve to examine is that between uh, the 30-day or 90-day bill rate, 90 bill rate, versus the 10-year Treasury note. So the 10-year Treasury note is now not quite two percent. The 30-day, uh, that's 30, 90-day 30, uh, bill rate is much less. So the yield curve is not close to being flat there, but it is close to being flat two years to 10 years. And some people look at two years to 10 years. So what is different today? Well, one thing is that the, the flattening from two to 10 is taking place before the Fed even starts its projected cycle of raising interest rates. Never will foresee. This is a very new thing. I didn't know that. <laughs> So, you know, it, 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 uh, what is a little bit different also about today is that the, 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 there's, a lot of, there's a lot of leverage or, or debt in corporate America. Uh, families are better financed than they were in 2006 and seven, but corporations and the government itself, leave the government itself aside for a second, but there's a lot of, of debt in the corporate world, a lot of private equity transactions that have entailed a whole lot of, uh, of leverage, leverage being a Wall Street term for encumbrance or debt. So the question is, um, as we look at interest rates now beginning to rise and the yield curve beginning to flatten by some measures, and you say, well, what, what does that mean? Well, it might mean that the economy has so much debt that even a, a, a measured or a nominal rise in yields would put pressure on companies that owe money, and they would have to uh, take steps to repay debt. They, they uh, you know, they'd have to uh, you know, fire people, uh, cut back production, to do things to uh, hunker down and uh, uh, they want to, to sell divisions. So, the, so, so the fear I think is that. Uh, um, the combination of the visible debt in the economy, the combination of that plus the visible flattening at some portions of the yield curve, and the intrusion 
uh, very high rates of inflation, all these three things are setting up for what we used to call stagflation in the 70s. Stagflation being, of course, the state of recession overlaid on inflation. Keynes even once said that was unlikely or impossible, but it did happen way back when. And I guess it could happen again. So why are we not seeing a steepening at the long end? I mean, do, do you, I mean, maybe does it have something to do with the uh, going out the risk curve? Like we were talking earlier from the standpoint of investors now might not buy treasuries for yield. Uh, they might buy the, buy treasuries for capital gains. Yeah. And, and do you think that may play into it? Well, I think that the, the, the bulls on bonds would say this. I think they would say that, uh, uh, that uh, of course, these securities are denominated in dollars and in time of geopolitical tension or war, right, what right. is dollar bills, and uh, that the treasury market is the beneficiary of that foreign demand for treasuries, as we speak, has slightly uh, strengthened. And um, they would say further that... Uh, observe over the past dozen or more years that when the Fed moved to raise its funds rate, this little tiny short overnight interest rate, that the longer dated portion of the treasury market did not go up in the yield, but rather stayed where it was or even rallied because people thought, well, now the economy really can't handle higher interest rates for the reasons that I've been trying to explain. And I think there's, a, there's, a, there's another thing, which is uh, pure muscle memory. Uh, interest rates have been falling since 1981. Mm, right, right. So that's 40, 41 years. And you have to be even older than I am, George, if that's, if that's conceivable. <laughs> the Wall Street, a successful Wall Street career is like 25 years. If, if, you're, if you're any good at all, you're playing golf and poker or a ton at the end of 20 years. So you could have one and a half Wall Street careers and never have seen a bond bear market. Right. Right. So people, um, uh, and I can tell you because I was I was around and uh, uh, the last time we had a bond bear market, but when that came to an end in 1981, people were still were, were scoffing at it into the through the 1980. Like, interest rates can't go down. Mm, right. 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 And and uh, the, the most intriguing portion of that particular phase of our history that I can recall is a. Something happened in 1984, and this is in, a little bit instructive on the question of muscle, muscle memory. So uh, um, I'm talking now about the 30-year treasury, and that yield peaked out in the fall of 1981 at 15%, if you can imagine, 15% on 30-year treasury bonds. So um, uh, that was, you know, that was about the time that Reagan had broke the air traffic controllers union, commodity prices broke. And it seemed as if this long cycle of inflation, uh, you know, thanks in part to Paul, Paul Volcker's very brutal monetary policy, was, was in the rear view mirror. But uh, just go forward three years, 1984, and money growth was kind of percolating, and Milton Friedman and Henry Calvin were saying, and this is two great thought leaders at the time, were saying, well, this is interest rates going right back up again, and they're going to go higher than they did before because of. Dot, 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 like money growth. And, and um, in the spring of 1984, interest rates got to, uh, again, in the 30 year bond, got to 14%. So that's how tenacious was the psychological hold on people that the, the interest rates are meant to go up. Right, right. Um, it was almost, uh, they can't go down, right? And we know that. They have been going up since 1946. Well, that was only 35 years of a bond bear market. We've had a bond bull market for now for 42 years. You know, historians might now date it like three years ago when yields got to you know, below 1%, but uh, interest rates at least have been going down or sideways for 41 years. And uh, people are different kind of a mindset. They are meant to continue to go down or sideways. Yeah. So from 46 to 81, that was the, the last cycle. Uh, is that correct? That was the last bear market in bonds, yes. That was, so, so, yeah. What, what do you think triggered that? Or what, was there just one catalyst or was it multiple things? 
And well, you, you look how back at, yeah. Learn, how would you learn from that to try to determine what a catalyst may be today? Yeah. Well, um, when you look back on it, the catalyst was uh, the Employment Act of 1946. Hmm. And signed legislation uh, saying that the United States was uh, responsible, the government was responsible for uh, a state of, uh, of high employment and uh, and economic stability. So that was the institution of Keynesian doctrine into, into federal law. And you think, well, yeah, of course, that was it. But that, you know, that, that was not exactly it um, in that, uh, when about the time that uh, Truman signed this, I'm just going to keep going from memory, the long bond yielded two and a quarter, 212, I guess that was the bottom, 2.12 about where the 10 year has been recently. Hmm. Um, and um, I can remember I did some, I, I actually lived through it. I was very young, I was only one. <laughs> <laughs> but my mother told me, George. <laughs> and, uh, but it took 10 years for that two and a quarter percent long dated uh, bond yield to get to three and a quarter. Oh, yeah, right. Not until, not until uh, 1956 or so did, uh, uh, did was that first 100 basis points, first one percentage point of that move higher. Mm. What happened was, uh, uh, so uh, the catalyst was something we see again, as they say now, in the rear view, but you don't know at the time. And I, 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 to me, the catalyst to me are almost innumerable now. I mean, right. what's wrong with these people? You got the Fed printing the six trillion dollars of the past M two is up forty odd percent in the past two years. The federal deficit blowout, and all these crazy ideas. You know, everyone's toying with or actually advocating so called modern monetary theory. The whole world's crazy, if you ask me, George. Yeah, but it seems like that muscle memory that you were referring <laughs> to earlier makes interest rate cycles almost like that uh, quote about going bankrupt. You know, yeah. it, it happens very, very slowly. And then all of a sudden, uh, yeah. to your point, you know, in 46, it takes 10 well, years. Well, you know, it, it, interest rates are so funny in that, you know, in that respect. You know, they, I don't think, it, I can't think of any other uh, department of finance that exhibits these long cycles. But, uh, and I'm not sure that they're a matter of physics. I'm not sure it's hard and fast. It's a law, capital L. But, uh, you know, since the U.S. Civil War, uh, from like 19, 1965, 1900, interest rates fell from 1900, 1920 or so, they rose, 1946, they fell. And then they, you know, they rose from 1946 to 81, and they have fallen for the past 42, 41 years. So um, in each of these cycles, people became acclimated, uh, you know, 20, even 20 years is a long time to watch something and not develop the notion that it's meant to be right, for all time. So that's that's the, the, the peculiar and intriguing nature of race. I, I've thought about this for a long time. I don't know what quality, you, you, you can kind of overlay to a degree, you can kind of imagine that monetary regimes might explain it. Um, but that's, I don't know, I, I, I leave it as a, as a mystery, but it's something to, to know has happened and to be and to be wary of those who contend now that, oh, yes, interest rates fall. That's what they do for a living. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> interest rates <laughs> yeah. fall. Well, yeah. let's, let's go back and I, I want to try to learn a little bit more about history. And um, one thing that I've tried to figure out is the late 1800s, from about the end of the Civil War, uh, to call it the 1900 or so. Um, I know that uh, just uh, the, the data is hard to come by, but from what I've seen, you know, we had a deflation of about maybe 2%, 3% per year, but nominal GDP actually went up. Uh, so did nominal wages from, from what I can gather, and even on a, a per capita GDP. So if you just look at those headline numbers, it would, it would imply that the standard of living would have increased uh, tremendously 
during that time frame as far as the lot of the poor in the middle class because their you know wages are going up but their purchasing power is increasing at the same time but then you hear a lot of people say that that was an extreme uh, depression because of the the deflation that we saw Did, have you dove into that period of history and and what would your conclusions be was, was that a time in which the poor and middle class where their lives got a lot better or was there what did it get worse because of the suffering, because it was a quote unquote depression. Well, those those uh, 35 years entailed uh, or, or comprised uh, many different business cycles. Uh, there were busts, there were booms, uh, but over the, if you generalize over the course of those three and a half decades, I agree with your first observations that the, there was a, a persistent undertow in prices. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, on some people, it, uh, it, was, it was very hard you know, for, for farmers living from hand to mouth, barely making a subsistence income. Um, I felt keenly the, uh, the nexus of rising railroad freight rates and uh, stable or falling uh, crop prices. Um, uh, but you know, the... Uh, uh, it was a time of, of, of wondrous technological innovation. You think about uh, the time before the incandescent bulb that was later in the period and the time after it. I mean, what did that do to productivity? What did uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the myriad inventions having to do with uh, internal combustion engines and the like, what, uh, the humble typewriter, all those things came into being uh, during that period. And uh, as I understand the period, I, I does some work in it. Um, real wages adjusted for inflation, just as you were saying before, were increasing. Mm -hmm. And um, people, I think, were on the whole, to generalize in a kind of a cosmic way, I think that people were, their lots were improving, not, not, not the opposite. And you kind of, that's kind of borne out in the politics, you know, the, the populist movement that was very noisy and it demanded relief from these, these blood sucking railroads and from the money trust in, in, the, in the New York City and from the, all the other enemies real and imagined. And uh, they put up political candidates to, to run on a doctrine of uh, the free silver, which is a kind of a code for inflation at the time. Mm. And those those uh, people lost in national elections. You know, Grover Cleveland, the gold standard guy, won twice. Uh, William Jennings Bryan, later in the period, uh, lost repeatedly in his bid for the presidency and for instituting a inflationary silver regime instead of the uh, the gold uh, uh, gold standard then in place. So I I think it was a, a time um, of uh, of uh, great progress and. To be sure, a time of uh, not universal profit. progress is never universal. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, my goodness, uh, when you look back on what uh, and comparing a lot of people in 1900 with a lot of people in 1866, it was, I think it's pretty clear that it was, uh, it was things for, the, the change was for the good. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what it seems to me as well. So let's move on a couple of decades. And I know that you wrote a book about the depression, uh, I believe 1920, 1921, that most people forget. In fact, I think that well, might if, be if they've forgotten the book too, I, I, I <laughs> should not have done, George. <laughs> but you, you know, when I, I've heard you talk about this uh, quite extensively. And um, I thought, you know, going back to 2020, obviously with COVID and, and the uh, similarities to the Spanish flu, I thought, you know, I wonder if that depression was was caused by the Spanish flu or the Spanish flu greatly contributed to that depression. Uh, do you have any insights on that? Well, the depression of 1920 was a uh, began um, in the aftermath of uh, America's participation in World War One, and it was a consequence, I believe, of the economic policies that. Uh, uh, with which we fought World War I. So it's a huge inflation. The Federal Reserve just got into business in 1914, 1915. And uh, you know, so it 
it got right down to work with uh, facilitating the uh, monetization of debt and expanding the money supply to enhance the inflation that uh, was part and parcel of almost every war. Yeah. Part of World War One. So the country emerged from this war uh, with the pandemic and with an inflation. The pandemic you know, died down. De- died down is actually all too apt to description as the uh, mortality of this was was uh, was brutal, much worse than COVID. Um, but you know, if you go back and, and look at uh, at the coverage, the journalistic coverage, and the f- official commentary on the pandemic, it was played down. Um, there wasn't anything like the, the universal uh, uh, hysteria. Yeah, hysteria. Uh, so I don't. I don't think that. I, to shorten my, I don't think the Spanish flu was responsible for the depression. And the depression came about because uh, of a huge inflation. Uh, the Fed met with very high interest rates, and there's a great credit contraction, and a great writing off of the investment errors of the World War One and post war period. Mm. And what was interesting to me about this depression it was because it was kind of the it, it, was, it was met with a federal policy that, that was more or less this, balance the budget and impose punitively high nominal and, of course, real interest rates. So um, the inflation turned to deflation, prices actually fell, and wages fell, and that was the key, because if wages had remained the same as prices fell, there would have been mass unemployment because corporations would have been losing money and would have had to discharge people en masse, right? The profit would have been crushed. But because wages fell along with prices, some companies at least were able to reestablish profitability at lower levels of nominal revenue. Right. So prices fell with the profit margin at the or at, at, that, at that juncture. So there was, there was no federal response beyond that. And uh, the depression was relatively short lived over, over and done within 18 months, but it was very severe. The stock market was down, uh, basically saw it in half, commodity prices down this half or more. Unemployment not then measured, it was, must have been in the teens. Uh, profits, corporate profitabilities uh, certainly plunged initially. Um, but uh, I, it was the last, I say, the last governmentally unmedicated business cycle downturn. And so to date in our history. Mm, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I, I, so I, you compare that with what happened in 1929 through 1946. I, others say, I say, that the depression did not end in the 1930s. It, it, it persisted a, like, a, like a low level chronic virus. You know, you take it out of bed in the morning without really wanting to. And uh, so the, I, t- I take the 1921 uh, episode as a vindication of laissez faire right. of its superficial brutality and inhumanity against the well-intended intervention of the pre-Keynesian and then the quasi-Keynesian era of the 1930s. What was the debt to GDP going into that depression? Well, it was very high because uh, if, I, I, federal debt was very high to GDP because of the finance of World War I. I, th- I think that, like the, feds, the federal government had like 1 billion going into the war, maybe it had, had 20 billion coming out of it. Um, uh, I, I can't give you an overall debt to GDP ratio. I, th- I think that there was a fair amount of, uh, of private borrowing facilitated by uh, the inflationary environment of the war and its immediate aftermath. Uh, certainly farmers borrowed to expand production as the government urged them to do, you know, fence post to fence post. It was a huge agricultural depression in the wake of the uh, of that inflation as, as uh, agricultural Prices plunged the farm. Indebted farmers had to liquidate, and they did. Yeah, you know, you're talking about sticky wages, and uh, I remember looking at a chart of the rate of inflation 
going back to probably the mid 1800s in the United States. And you can see prior to the 1930s, it's just like a heartbeat. I mean, it goes up and down and up and down, you know, inflation, deflation, inflation, deflation, inflation, deflation. It kind of ends up around zero or, you know, prices from 1800 to 1900 went down by 50%. Uh, but you had a lot, a lot of bouts of inflation in there as well. But once you get to the 1930s, you pretty much have almost zero uh, deflation, a uh, very, very little, you know, a couple of little blips there in uh, the 1940s. And I think one during the GFC. But I always thought that maybe that's because wages now are, are, are so sticky because in the 1930s, and correct me if I'm wrong, they came out with the minimum wage. Uh, they came out with welfare and Social Security. So, uh, you know, it's got more government aggregate demand, if you will, uh, in, when times are tough. And then you've got a, a, a floor on the price of wages. Therefore, uh, a business can't, you know, if their revenues go down, th instead of staying in business because wages go in, uh, down, now they just go bust. So then that affects the supply side. Do you think there's anything to that? I, I do. Um, the first thing that Hoover, Herbert Hoover did when confronted with um, a business cycle downturn that was not going to be as mild as some thought it would be in the spring of 1930, he called all the industrialists, uh, leading industrialists to Washington and said that, uh, um, that he was not prepared to lead this country to a uh, repeat episode of 1920-21. Mm. It fell so disastrously. And this time, he said to these people, including Henry Ford and others of that caliber, let us maintain wages above all things. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, and Hoover was, uh, was uh, uh, sec uh, Secretary of Commerce to uh, President Harding in 1921. And uh, you know, um, it was certainly well intended, but the effect was uh, not what was intended. Mm. Uh, mass unemployment. And I, you, I, we're both talking in shorthand. They all these things are a little bit nuanced. But um, uh, I, I do think that, uh, well, here, here's, here's, here's a quotation from William McChesney Martin. Uh, it's about 1955, I think, which is a year, by the way, in which a CPI did actually register uh, a small year over year decline. Mm. So Martin, the Fed chairman, then was worried about inflation. He's always worried about inflation. He's one of the great warriors about inflation. And um, he said something, this is almost a direct quote. He said, uh, and don't forget, he said, the, the purchasing power once lost, the purchasing power of a dollar once lost to inflation is never regained. Mm. So it was at the time, times before that, times before the the gold standard was abrogated, um, that, as you say, there'd be cycles of deflation, cycles of inflation, and uh, kind of over long stretches of time, the price level didn't change. As a measure, although the measure of the price level is really is much less precise than many people would, 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 uh, would contend. Yeah. Uh, but now, you know, pe people say, what's the damage today of this, the tra this transient Transitory 7% inflation. Well, the, the problem is that, that 7% is gone. And you're saying that's gone. Right, right, right. Nothing. <laughs> that, that's what people, yeah, they, they, even if it's, it's, it's not like they're going back down. Once you get a high watermark, uh, it, it's not going back down to where it was in 2019. Even if it flatlined, it's still at that high watermark. Uh, yeah. If beef goes from $5 to $10, even if it flatlines for the next two years, it's still $10. Well, some, yeah, some they can go back down, but the, but the overall basket of things that you buy is, gonna, is not going to go down. It's going gonna, it's gonna, to, yeah. Yeah. So, Jim, I know I've, I've kept you over the allotted time, and I, I sincerely appreciate, uh, you know, the conversation. I, I want to just end by asking not just your opinion on gold, uh, because I think that would be a boring type of question that you've been uh, asked, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Yeah, always the same answer. <laughs> Yeah, right. Speak it, talking about muscle memory, right? <laughs> or genetic impulse. Yeah, but but more so, how do you value it? Like like you know, we say, well, this is cheap or this is expensive. How do you know when gold is cheap? Oh, it's treacherous. It's, it's, it's this, this gold is is so hard. You know, it's um, 
I think conceptually, you know, the press of gold is a reciprocal of the world's faith in, in central banks and, and managers, you know, it's one divided by trust. That's yeah, the, right. But that's, that's, I think that's okay as a conceptual starting point, but the, it, there's no PE price earnings ratio, there's no book value, there's no earnings yield, although gold does out yield. A lot. It, 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 only recently, there were like $18 trillion worth of bonds in the world priced to yield less than nothing in nominal terms. So gold was out yielding uh, at zero, it was out yielding that cohort of so-called fixed income securities. But gold is an idea. But it's certainly a, it's, it's eminently, famously tangible. It's thicker than lead. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's the most wondrous thing probably in the periodic table for all sorts of reasons. But it's, 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 it, for all of that, for all its tangibility, all its physical beauty, it's, it's, an, it's a concept. Not to, it's a monetary concept. And you, you buy it because you just know, you just know that things are going the wrong way at the Fed. Mm. But you, know, you have to be careful because uh, I've, I've owned this stuff, uh, I, I was about to say off and on, I've owned it on with varying degrees of, in, in, uh, of intense conviction all, all my adult life, basically. Um, and just when you think that, uh, you know, like in the aftermath of the Lehman crack up, aha, it was down a quick 30 or 40 percent. Yeah, there's liquidity. Right. And people were selling because it is liquid. Right. And they and they but I, I have a friend of mine who um, a dear friend, no, a dear friend, a dear business acquaintance, that's different. But I was very close to in a business way, committed suicide. He was a he was a gold guy who. Um, it committed, and all his employees were in these gold, little tiny gold stocks, and, and he had done so well with them, and they thought so well of him, and he was a hero of a small town, he was a banker, and he was so all about uh, gold, and, he, was, and he took a shotgun in the shower because he could not handle it, so you have to be careful, you have to be careful, you can't fall in love with anything, you can't fall in love with bonds, stocks, land, gold, nothing, love is more something else <laughs> so gold is is again it's it's an essential thing to own or something it's an essential part of one's portfolio because we live in a world of monetary fictions but these monetary fictions can be very powerful the narrative of a successful fed think of think of the durability of the narrative of the all-knowing fed survive the visible ineptness of 2004, five, six, seven, when they had no idea what was going on in front of their very face. It has survived the ineptness of the past year when they had no conviction at all about the risks that they ran in calling inflation transitory. So, the, so as, as, as seemingly um, feeble, and as, as vulnerable as the PhD standard might seem to be, it is in some respects as hard as steel. <laughs> People do believe it. And believing it, they are prepared to turn their back on gold because uh, they're simple, because they, they know that uh, there are better things in the world to own. So that's, that's my little speech on gold. <laughs> yeah, that's great, Jim. Um, well, I've got about a thousand more questions, but we'll have to get to that next time. So well, another, for, for a thousands podcast, we'll get through it all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about Grant's interest rate. Oh, yes. you, you talked about it earlier. Uh, what is it all about for, I mean, my, my, uh, viewers who are, you know, my age, older, they're going to know well, exactly what yeah. it is, but, uh, very, the, very quickly, Joy, this, this, this is my life's work. It's, it's, um, it's uh, going to be 40 years old next year, just like me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's, you started it when you were one, when we were yeah. talking about that. <laughs> yeah, my mother helped me, for sure, for the first three years. And, no, it started in 1983. I've been doing it since then. And um, we publish every two weeks. We mean to uh, have the, um, the best ideas, the best pros, the most imaginative, forward-looking commentary analysis, and the funniest cartoon on page one. And sometimes we succeed. That's Grant's interest rate. Of That's the 12 pages. Uh, you subscribe at the, I can't, I've forgotten what the, what some people call the very high price, but I regard it as an absurdly low price at $1,400 a year. 
a little less perhaps if you ask nicely. Uh, but you know, that's that's what we do for a living. And uh, oh, oh, and one one last thing. Some people might wonder, okay, this guy is 75 and a half years old. What is he doing writing about this stuff at this grandfatherly stage of life? Well, I can I don't know the answer to that, but I can tell you that somebody took out a 10 year subscription just last week. Yeah, 10 years. How's that for how's that for optimism? <laughs> <laughs> okay, got to go. <laughs> All right, Jim. Where, what's the URL? Uh, just uh, the Google Grants Interest Rate Observer, and the, the, or the the uh, it's Grants Pub G R A N T S P U B dot com. We have a big website. We have all sorts of things to lure you into what we do, and we have something called Grants Almost Daily Grants, which is available for the price of free. You can read A D G Almost Daily Grants. For nothing, and then you'll find yourself in the sales funnel, <laughs> exorably to the uh, flagship product, which costs, uh, um, as I say, uh, a ridiculously low annual fee. All right, Jim. Thanks for your time. <laughs> okay, uh, George. Great to talk. Love your hat. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Okay. So long. Bye. Bye.